everyone, this is the short video that goes with chapter six. Um, and we're talking this week about socio-emotional development in infancy, so that zero to two range. Um, when you're thinking about socio-emotional development, you know, think about emotions, also socialization. Um, emotions are what we call orthogenic in nature, um, in the sense that they start out as, as relatively undifferentiated and they become more differentiated. So when a baby is first born, um, their emotions are pretty basic, right? They're either satisfied or they're crying, right? And so they have negative emotion and neutral to positive emotion. Um, they cry, something's not perfect. Do they know what's not perfect? I don't know. I'm not sure anybody really knows um, exactly what it is. There are different cries that are associated with different things, of course, but as they get older during that first year, um, their emotions differentiate. And so you start to see um, self-reflective emotions, and your book talks about this, um, the idea of shame. Um, in order to have shame, you have to not just regret something or be sad about something or even feel guilty about it, but know that somebody else noticed it. And so until you have that level of self-awareness and other awareness, um, the, the emotion of shame doesn't emerge. Um, during the first year, um, you start to see um, both stranger anxiety and separation anxiety. Um, initially, when a baby is handed from one person to the next, um, it's unlikely that the reason that they're crying has anything to do with the person. In other words, some babies don't like those transitions. Um, they were going to cry anyway, no matter who you handed them to. Um, so, um, so don't feel bad if they cry uh, when they're handed to you. Um, but in the second half of the first year, they do start to develop an awareness of patterns um, and they start to know who people are. Um, and that's when they start to develop stranger anxiety and they're more reticent when they're meeting somebody for the first time. Um, so it starts in perhaps the second half of the first year, peaks and then starts to go away. Now, all of us may feel a little bit of anxiety when we meet a person for the first time. Um, some people more than others, depending on their personality. Um, but for babies, that's something that they're first developing. And it shows us that they are realizing who different people are and they're able to differentiate them. Um, for separation anxiety, um, that's when they start to notice that uh, when you go away, something different happens. And so uh, when, when you go to the babysitter's house and you um, put them down, they start to see that pattern of, oh, you're going to leave me. Um, and I like it way better when you're here. Um, please don't go away. And so they start to get that separation anxiety and start to be clingy when they weren't before. Um, one example of that that I think is important to understand is um, children, infants who have been in daycare or been in some form of, of out of home care um, from a very early age uh, will start to develop some form of, or often develop some sort of uh, uh, separation anxiety um, during the first year. And you ask yourself, I say, hey, look, I've been taking my child to this preschool every day for months, and now all of a sudden, they scream when I leave and they don't want me to leave. What's happening at the daycare? Is there something that's going on that I don't know about? Um, and I think we should always be in tune to that. We should always be um, looking at the signals our children are giving us, particularly when they're pre-verbal. Um, on the other hand, um, it is normal to develop separation anxiety where you didn't have it before and it's a normal part of the emotional growth of the child. So it doesn't always mean that something's different in the environment. It could be that something's different within the child and that's what's causing them. Um, okay, so um, the next topic is temperament. Um, and there are two models for temperament that are presented in your book. One is Mary Rothbart's um, uh, model and the other is the Thomas and Chess model. Um, I'm gonna talk primarily in this course about the Thomas and Chess model. Um, so those would be the categories of temperament that are difficult, uh, uh, easy, and slow to warm up. And so the easy baby, you know, when you think about temperament, um, it's biologically based. It's not biologically determined. You'll see that um, in the Kagan video. Um, but it is biologically based and so, it, you know, you're likely to have some similarities to one or both of your biological parents in that respect. Um, an easy baby has an easy time with transitions. It's easy for them. It's also easy for their caregivers. You wake them up. They're relatively interested in what's going on. Um, you feed them. You change them. You do those kinds of things. They smile a lot. They laugh a lot. Um, they also remember those um, heredity environment correlations. When they laugh a lot, other people laugh with them, and that starts a, um, a cascade um, in a positive direction. So 
um, that that uh, it helps them to develop their ultimate personality. Um, for the child that's difficult, um, it's difficult for them. It's also difficult for the people around them. Um, the difficult child um, is is uh, you know may cry when they wake up. Um, and they may cry when you start to feed them, and they may cry when you um, start to change them, and when you put them in the stroller to go out or put a jacket on them, they cry. They cry at all the transitions. It's hard for them. It's also hard to deal with a, a crying baby, so it can be difficult a difficult interaction for the caregiver as well. Um, and then there are other children who are slow to warm up. Um, they start out to look just a little bit on the cranky side, but they're able to bring it around and regulate their emotions in some way. Um, if you have an easy baby, um, you're going to think you're a great parent, and I hope that you are. I'm sure you are. Um, but it isn't just all you. You, can, you can't take all of the credit for that. However, if you have a difficult baby that cries all the time, you don't get all the blame for that either. Um, temperament is something that's biologically based. The children are born with that, um, and that influences the interactions that they're going to have as an infant and a toddler and, and you, know, throughout, you know, throughout their lifespan. Um, goodness of fit uh, refers to the idea that if you're raised by your biological parents, it's more likely, um, statistically, that you will share some of those temperamental characteristics or, or they will at least understand what it was like. So if you're a difficult baby, you may have one or both parents that also had a hard time taking naps and, and coming, you know, waking up and, and rejoining the group. Um, you know, so they may understand it in a different way. They may provide a different passive environment for you because they understand your temperament in a way that um, somebody who's not related to you might not understand quite as well. It doesn't mean that they won't understand it. Um, it just means that, um, that a, good fit, a good fit can happen with biological parents. It can happen in daycare. It can happen with adoptive parents. A good fit can happen anywhere, but um, that fit between uh, the child's temperament and the environment um, can be an important component. Um, and uh, we don't talk about adults as having a temperament. We talk about adults as having a personality. Their temperament will, uh, will influence the way they interact with people across situations, which will eventually become what we will call their temperament uh, when they get to be adults. Um, um, the attachment research um, that's discussed, um, the attachment research um, categorizes children into um, secure attachment, meaning um, they might be upset when you leave, but when you come back, they're comforted by your return. So um, they might cry when you leave the room, but when you come back in the room, they're glad to see you and they settle back down. That is indicative, using that strange situation that's described in the book, um, is indicative of a secure attachment. Um, the insecure attachments fall into a couple of different categories, and the main ones would be um, an insecure avoidant attachment or an insecure resistant, or it's alternately referred to as ambivalent. So resi resistant and ambivalent mean the same thing in that context. Um, the avoidant child um, doesn't particularly use the caregiver as a secure base. They don't seem to take any comfort from the fact that they're in a new situation perhaps and there's somebody that they know around, they tend to ignore them and avoid them. Um, they avoid them while they're there. They also avoid them when they come back if they leave and leave the child alone or leave the child with a stranger. Um, the resistant child or the ambivalent child, um, you know, ambivalence, um, I used to, you know, before I was studying emotions, I used to think of ambivalence as I don't care. So, you know, somebody says, you wanna to go to this restaurant or that restaurant, I'm ambivalent. Um, and ambivalence really means um, ambi, like ambidextrous, it means both. Um, and valent refers to emotions. And so ambivalent is the presence of both positive and negative emotions. Um, so the ambivalent, the insecure ambivalent or the insecure resistant child um, wants to be picked up and wants to be held and wants to cling to you. Um, and then when you pick them up and they cling to you, they push away and they wanna get down and they're, they're just sort of not satisfied either way. They have both positive and negative emotions. Um, and then um, as with temperament, um, you know, there are a number of children that are harder to classify. So here's the thing I'd like you to think about when it comes to temperament and attachment. Um, the uh, temperament researchers will say, we're not sure that there really is such a thing as attachment per se, that attachment is what children of a particular temperament do. Um, so the child with an easy temperament, uh, when presented with a strange situation, they're in a, you know, a strange environment, uh, perhaps the only person they know leaves the room or leaves them with a stranger, um, the child with an easy temperament may cry when you leave, but when you come back, they'll settle down relatively quickly and get back to playing with the toys that they were playing with. The child with the difficult temperament in that situation, um, particularly the, the resistant ambivalent, but, um, but the avoidant one as well, is always gonna look like they have an insecure attachment because they aren't gonna be comforted or completely comforted by the renewed presence of their care, caregiver. Um, so, you know, one of the things to think about when you're thinking about temperament and thinking about attachment is, 
are they really two different things? Like, is, can you have an attachment style that is independent of your temperament? Or once you know the child's temperament, can you, with some degree of reliability, predict their attachment? Um, and there, you know, there, there are uh, researchers who feel both ways. Um, and so it's just something for you to think about. Um, I know how I feel, but um, you know, you don't have to feel the same or, or understand it in the same way that I do. I just want you to be aware of, of that distinction. Um, okay, so that's it for chapter six. Um, I'm gonna make another video that has to do with um, papers, uh, which may or may not interest you. Uh, if you need help with that, great. If you don't, great. Um, and have a good week. Thanks, bye.